Welcome to another video in my multi-part series about making video games. Um, as usual, I'm Tom Robertson, and we will be working on a game project and going through the base code together and then expanding it together. Uh, this video will cover the third project of our set of 3D game projects. Previously, we have done a uh, simple spinning spaceship project and then also a, an air hockey table project. But uh, this project, we're going to get down to first-person shooters. It's going to be awesome. As usual, we'll go to learning.eochu.com to download the base files for this project. And again, as usual, we'll be using our development environment will be C Sharp 2010 Express Edition. Uh, it's a visual C Sharp and it's from Microsoft. Um, we'll also be using XNA 4.0. So you can see on the screen here that I'm looking at my learning.eochu.com and I find Project FPS Boxy. So let's download those files. Now before I unpack those files, I want to build an actual project, and the project is going to be called FPS Boxy. So let's go ahead and fire up our C Sharp 2010 Express Edition. Uh, it was an XNA Game Studio 4.0 Windows Game 4.0 project. Uh, I'll put it in my normal directory and I will call it FPS Boxy. See how I spelled that? Capital F, capital P, capital S, capital B, O, X, Y. All right, of course, as usual, we give the development environment time to create the project from scratch, and it'll create a bunch of new files and put it all into the system explorer, sorry, the solution explorer on the right, and uh, then we'll be able to hit F5 and see if the program runs and gives us a blue screen of happiness. Yes, there it is, blue screen of happiness. We now have an empty project that we can copy our data and, and files into. Going back to my browser here, I've downloaded my FPS boxy files and I'm going to click on them to open them up. Now there's a lot of stuff in here, but we've done this before. We've got to take all the .cs files, which are the C sharp code files, and put them in the correct directory. And we've got to basically take everything else and put it in the other correct directory. Now one of the things we see about this uh, new project that hopefully shouldn't scare you too much is that we're, uh, we've got several .cs files. We've got several c -sharp source code files. Uh, that means that our program is scattered over multiple files, not just in one source directory like it was for the previous two projects. You know, don't let this scare you. This is the normal way of things, and it's also the normal way of things in C-sharp that a single .cs file normally corresponds to a single class, which is, you know, of course, a C-sharp concept. It's not a C-sharp concept. It's a, an object-oriented concept, which is uh, available in many languages, including C-sharp, C++, Java, lots and lots of other languages. Object-oriented programming and the idea of a class object and a class hierarchy is not supposed to be anything new to you. All right, I copied all that data and code, but as we know, it's not real until we actually add it to the solution. Yes, I changed game one, but I'm going to do a lot more changing. I'm going to right-click on FPS Boxy here, add existing item, add all these .cs files. Then I'm going to go over to the content directory and I'm right, going to right click add existing. Now I'm going to add a bunch of stuff here, but what I'm going to try to do is not add the PNG files that are textures associated with meshes. Because as we've mentioned before in this series, the way C Sharp XNA works is that it loads the meshes in the .x files and there are already associated textures which it then automatically also loads. So if we add those textures separately to the solution, it's going to complain that it has you know too many references to the bitmap. 
So we're going to add mostly just .x files plus this flare.png texture. Skybox, Rollbox, and that looks like it. Hitting F5, seeing what happens. All right. I have a first person point of view in this little window on my screen. I can use my WASD keys and my mouse to move around the world. Let's look at what's going on here. I can drive, I can see a sky. Specifically, we can tell very clearly and easily that it's a box. And there are walls. There are walls that I can run into. And it looks like I cannot go into the wall. I'm trying to bounce off the wall here. There's also a floor that I can walk on. There are weird white lines that we will certainly talk about. And there are also green things pointing into the sky. Now one thing that I would really like to point out is that these special walls are not actually special walls, they are doors. They're big fat cubicle doors and we're going to bump into one and that will cause it to shrink into the ground allowing us to step on it. Now I'll bump into the next door and it'll do the same thing. Raise it down. It'd be nice if there was a cool sound effect of the door, but you know, hey, we're gonna have to add that ourselves, either with our own voice or by actually, you know, adding a sound effect, which we know how to do. We've done that before. All right, so that is our 3D world. There's one more aspect of our 3D world, and that's my space bar. No, no, it's not my space bar. It's my fact that I can point up and push forward with the W key and actually fly in the air because my gravity is so weak. And now I seem to be standing on a raised block. And now I can see the entire maze. All right, well that's awesome and beautiful. How does it work? Well, one of the first things that you should notice when you're looking at this new project is the fact that everything seems very blocky. And of course, you should have, you know, been clued in by the fact that I call it FPS Boxy. So what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is that if you worked on the previous project in this series, which was the, uh, the air hockey table, you found that we made the entire air hockey table and the various paddles and things out of a simple cubicle three-dimensional mesh. And guess what? We're pulling the same sneaky stuff now. Uh, what's happening is that the whole world is made up of these cubes. And we have pre-built a cube, and we have pre-painted all six sides of the cube. We painted the top of the cube with a floor texture, and the bottom of the cube with a ceiling texture, and the four walls. And we've made the world simply by making a bunch of cubes, and making it so that when you collide with them, you collide with a cube. I'm going to take a detour here and go into my favorite free 3D editor, which you probably know is called Dell Ed CE, D E L E D space C E. And we're going to take a look at one of these cubes and how it's actually prepared and what its dimensions are. All right, we are looking at the wall box that we created for the game using our Dell Ed CE 3D tool. So this is uh, not necessarily the 3D tool you're gonna use. You might use Blender, you might use um, Maya or Max, whatever you as a student can get your hands on. Uh, Dell Ed CE is a very bare bones 3D editor, but it's very useful in that it's free and it behaves a great deal like 3ds Max in terms of its basic functionality. So you can easily pick it up and drag around with the mouse and the various... For right now I'm moving my mouse around and then I'm moving the position of my camera with by holding down control. So as you can see I've got on the bottom I've got a texture and I've got four so three things. Now this is all the same texture it's just textured so that part of the texture that represents the floor is on top, part of the texture that represents the ceiling is on the bottom, and so on. And 
we've built the whole world out of these boxes. Now if we look very carefully here, we can actually determine the dimensions of this box. Looks like it's 50 on a side. Where have we seen this before? That's right, again, in the previous projects we had a box that was 100 on a side, which is to say positive 50 to negative 50 because we centered the box on the origin. Remember, that's how we do things with 3D objects, is we normally, when we build them by themselves as a 3D file, we try to center them around 0, 0, 0. And that gives us the most flexibility when we actually bring them into our computer program, because as you recall from previous 3D projects, we have to use three matrices to, uh, to convert these objects to the screen space, or to, to draw them on the screen. And the very first matrix is called the world, or object matrix. And that matrix's job is to take that object, in this case, a cube that we draw multiple times to make the world, and move it in 3D space to where it's supposed to go. So keeping our objects, when we create them, around the zero, zero, zero location is sometimes critical for helping us place objects in the right place in our 3D worlds. So the, uh, the doors that I showed you, that is the other blocks that are colored differently and that shrink into the floor, are the same exact cube, just with a different texture. I'm sure you understand that now that we've made this world, this first-person shooter world that we're driving around in, out of individual cubes. And you probably understand now that the floor that you've been walking around on is not actually a floor at all. It's just a bunch of cubes that are actually lower than the other cubes. And that's fine. But remember I've been telling you the whole time we've been discussing 3D, that 3D is a giant lie and that one of the biggest problems with 3D being a lie is that what we draw on the screen doesn't have anything to do with how we collide with the world. We have to build our own collision geometry, we have to do our own collision detection and our own collision resolution because the drawing part of it doesn't have anything to do with collision really. So in our case, how we're doing collision is a very basic way of doing collision. We're building a cube around the visible cube, an invisible cube. And this cube, we're just looking at and saying uh, in our collision detection step, is the point which corresponds, of course, to the, to the, to the avatar, the, the thing you're driving around, which in this case is kind of a point on the floor with an invisible stick and a camera on top of it. Is that avatar point inside the cube? If so, then the collision resolution phase is, says whatever is the closest face of the cube, we should push the point out to that face. In other words, here's a cube, and here's the intruder coming in. As soon as the intruder crosses the boundary and gets inside the cube somehow, then we should look at all six sides of the cube and say, which six sides of the cube is closest? Well, the closest one is where we should be pushing the point. Now, this is actually really you know, cool in some ways. One of the ways is that if I'm driving along and gravity is pulling me down, that means I'm kind of coming at an angle. And remember, the floor is just the top of the box, so it's still collision, and we're still doing collision with the top of the box. That's how we stand on the box and not sink through it. If we're moving and colliding at an angle, then what happens is that we move through the surface at an angle, and then when we collide and we do collision resolution, our choice is to find that the, is that the top is clearly the closest thing, and therefore we're going to move it straight up. So you see that our, our step is kind of at an angle, and then up, and at an angle, and then up, and then an angle, and then up, and then an angle. And what this means is that even when we're colliding and being pushed back by walking along the top of the box, we're actually still able to move. We don't get frozen. It's like it's not like this collision causes us to step in mud. It's more like we're walking on ice, which is actually more of what we want to do anyway. I think we should explore this code and see how the code works to make a 3D world that we can interact with. So now I'm going to open up game1.cs. At the top, we have our normal usings. 
Here's our namespace FPS boxy, that's normal. And remember, all these .cs files that we're using for our project should have the same exact namespace. FPS boxy, and that is case specific. You gotta make sure that it's all typed in the same. Okay, we've got our content graphics and sprite batch, which are all the same as normal. We've got something called a tick counter, which is fine, that's just a variable. Um, we've got our game one, our constructor for game one, and the top of it is nothing new. We create an object called particle system, and I will get into that a little later. And then we create the player list. Now, as it says in the comment, when we're creating the player list, we're not creating a player. We're just creating the player list. Container classes in C Sharp, this is a language thing, are their own object separate from the things that they contain. However, in this particular case and in many other container classes, you, know, you define the thing that the container is going to contain as part of the definition of the container. So that a box that's supposed to hold baseballs does not instead hold hot dogs. You've got another box for hot dogs and you know neither the twain shall meet. And if you try to put a hot dog into a box made for a baseball, you, the, the compiler will throw an error message. That's actually what you want. You want to get that kind of type checking to, uh, to help you not make a mistake when you're handling container objects and the objects they contain. And notice that this particular list is actually a member, uh, a static member of player itself. So the list of players is referenced by player.list. All right, here's where we load content. We create the sprite batch, that's nothing normal, new. Um, this is where we set up the aspect ratio and create the projection matrix. We've done this before. Remember, we have three matrices that we must have and, and, and must be used as part of our drawing. And here's our projection matrix, also known as our screen matrix, um, that we're creating here with a 45 degree field of view and a near plane and a far plane of one and looks like 10,000. And then we create the particle system, or we, we don't create the particle system, we previously created it, but we call it setup. And uh, that's just more setup for that. And then we make the map. And of course we have an actual map.cs which contains a whole lot of data about how the map is handled. We'll get into that. And then we clear the player list, uh, make a new player, and add it to the list. Remember, uh, in our, uh, up here in our constructor, we created the list, but we didn't create any players. We just created the list that, con that contains them. Here, we're clearing the list of any players that might be there. I'm not sure why, because I don't think we've created any yet. We've made a brand new player and called it P, and we add it to the list. Now, P still references the player, and there's still a reference to the player in the player list. But they're both references. There's only one player. Uh, so, unload content, we shut down the particle system. Uh, ha, here we are in update. And update's pretty simple and small. You can see that this piece of code it's kind of nice, but it actually reads the keyboard, hits escape, we leave the, the game. So if we're, if we're running the game and we hit the escape key, the whole game should just shut down. And then this business, this tick counter business, what's going on there? Well, we definitely have seen before how we use elapsed time, elapsed game time milliseconds to adjust our game speed to the frame rate of the computer we're running on. This allows us to run our game at the same apparent rate whether we're running on a slow computer or a fast computer. And that's very awesome. But one of the problems is, is that it makes us have to do the math or, or multiply every action we do, every physical movement or adjustment of the game by, that, uh, by, the, by the time value. And that can get tedious, especially if we have a very object-oriented approach where you know, we're calling the tick function or the, the update function of many different objects throughout the game. We have to pass in the milliseconds for all of them. Well, there's actually a better way. And this code actually sets it up so that it actually ticks according to the milliseconds, 
but allows the ticks inside this loop to run at what appears to them to be a constant rate. In other words, we don't have to worry about the milliseconds here in this function. Everything else that's an update call assumes that update is at a regular rate and doesn't even have to worry about milliseconds. And that's you know, kind of the best of both worlds. So within this function, we're doing the things that, that moves the game simulation forward. And that includes updating the map, updating all the players, and updating the particle system. So updating all the players probably is only going to update one player because, well, we probably only have one player. And we'll jump into all these updates in just a second. So that's it, though. That's the sum total of our update. And frankly, that's the way I like it. The, the, the game1.cs update, it's nice that it's really simple and all it does is call update on all the various subsystems of your game so that you can focus on the individual subsystems and not really have to worry about who's getting updated. So now we're looking at draw, and draw is similarly not all that big of a deal. So here's the whole draw, and as we start, we start as we often do, clearing the screen buffer to cornflower blue. And then we do a few extra interesting things. We're going to set graphics device blend state to opaque. That means we're going to draw textures as they appear to be. In other words, uh, whenever we have a dot on our texture that's brown and it is placed on the screen, we draw that pixel as brown, the color of the texture. It's very simple replacement. And the reason we do it here this way is because we're going to do it differently another way. So then we disable the z-buffer for the skybox. So we've never really done a skybox in our 3D games before. And skyboxes are cool because if you have seamless textures and you have a good artist, it can be a very simple piece of geometry that looks like an entire world, like a whole sky, and it's really amazing and it's beautiful. And, and uh, you know, there are many different ways to do skyboxes, but one of the most simple is why it gets its name. Is you take a six-sided piece of geometry, make all of its faces, of course, face inward instead of outward, and you paint textures on all six sides, and you carefully match them up so they're seamless, and then you adjust your settings just right and draw the box around the camera. It's almost like you put your head in a box. And wow, it looks like a sky. It's really awesome. The sky in this one, I don't have blended textures. I don't have nice things. I, you know, the, 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 the texture's not very high resolution. I'm certain that if you went online, you could find yourself a really nice skybox texture. And that might be something cool to do in this project. But the nice thing about skyboxes is that um, even if they don't look good, they certainly cover up that cornflower blue background of, of the, that we painted on the world. So, another really interesting and important aspect of skyboxes is that the box itself, while it's supposed to be the whole sky, is actually quite small. What's going on here? Well, if you haven't researched it yet, there's something in your video card called a Z-buffer. So, what is a Z-buffer? A Z-buffer is a little bit like the pixels you already have on your screen. In other words, there's data in every pixel. We, we have a screen that's uh, um, orderly rows and columns of pixels, and we already know that each of those pixels contains information, specifically red, green, blue, and for off-screen textures, uh, sometimes A or alpha. But we know that alpha doesn't really exist for your actual drawn screen, for the actual screen of your display. It's just red, green, and blue. And you may or may not know this, but it's generally accepted that at least at the time that I'm doing this, and has been for a long time, each red, green, and blue value that you see on your screen takes up a byte of data. An unsigned byte, which means the numbers can go from 0 to 255. Okay? Not 0 to 100, but 0 to 255 because that's a round number for computers, for binary math. Uh, so, not only do we have the red, green, and blue numbers for each individual dot, but when we're talking about a 3D game, 